Hey, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's look real quiz, quick, quiz, quick, quickly at uh, Amos chapter 2. And something that we, uh, that we hold dear to our hearts around here is that if we're older, we have a responsibility to connect with, mentor, be an example for, train and equip, uh, not just our own generation, which how many of you say I, am, I can always use some more equipping, um, but also those who are rising up after us, emerging, this emerging generation. And Amos uh, chapter 2 kind of gives us the spirit of that. If I can get it here. The Holy Spirit, obviously, prophetically speaking through the prophet Amos, He's talking about some really uh, difficult times. He's confronting uh, stuff within culture. And uh, this is the culture of the, that the people of God had allowed to take over their land. And the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, look, you know, you're asking me to rescue you out of all of these difficulties that are basically self-inflicted. And... The nuts and bolts of it is, he says, and here I raise up from your own sons and daughters this delivering, zealous force that will change and impact the culture. And the older generation couldn't get it together enough to actually lead them, to recognize it, to link arms with them and see this come about. So it was like in verse 10, Amos 2.10. It was, it was I who brought you out of Egypt. Uh, um, verse 9, I destroyed the Amorites uh, bef before you. Uh, in other words, I've always gone ahead of you to bring about a deliverance. And then, and then the Lord says, in verse, let's see, uh, 11. And I raised up some of your sons to be prophets and other young men to be Nazarites. Now, now who are these Nazarites in the, in the scripture? The Samuel, the prophet Samuel, the first of the prophets. Uh, Samson was a Nazarite. So these were guys that were recognized because they didn't cut their hair. Um, but what made them powerful was the purity of their pursuit. That they didn't mix their pursuit with wine, women, and song. And they, 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 were, they were separate from certain things. But this older generation... Even though God says, I raised up some of your sons to be prophets and your young men to be Nazarites, is this not so, declares the Lord. So the Lord's forcing the issue with them. Now, if we could stop right there, uh, our children are generous the way we're generous. They're, they're hospitable the way we're hospitable. They are, they live lives Almost 100% of the time, there are a few exceptions, but almost 100% of the time, the way we live is reflected in our kids. Amen? I mean, if you have tension in your house and you send your kid off to school, you know that anyone who talks to your kids is going to know what condition your house is in because your child is going to blab about it. They're, they're, they're going to reflect that. They're going to find out exactly what's going on in your house if they just sit down and talk to your kid for a little while. So your kid is going to speak it, do it, model it the way that they're brought up. So God, through Amos, is really hanging this around the neck of this established generation where God is saying, hey, look, um, remember Joel 2? In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. 
What is the point of that? God doesn't do anything unless he first reveals it to a prophetic people. Why? Because someone needs to say it in the earth for it to be so, for there to be any chance of it coming about. And so here God saying through Amos to this generation, you wanted to see the tide turn, and I raised up prophets, but you told them not to prophesy. And then the condition of the church today is, so much of the Christian church doesn't even believe there are prophets, doesn't even believe in prophecy, despises prophecy like this generation did in Amos. And he wanted to raise up powerful leaders. You know, these Nazarites, they all ended up with governmental influence. Samson was a judge. Samuel was a judge and a prophet. We look at these guys who are called to live these separated, radically pure lives, and God says, I raised up from your own loins, from your own bodies, your children, to be Nazarites, who were deliverers with governmental influence, but you said to them, have some wine. Well, we all know that Drinking a little wine or having an occasional beer is not unbiblical, but it's not powerful. It's not profitable. All kinds of things are legal, but it's not profitable. So when God raises up a generation, we want to link arms with that and encourage that, right? And not say, hey, you know, we're having Thanksgiving dinner. We always drink wine at Thanksgiving dinner. And two of the people sitting at the table are two of your sons and daughters who are called as Nazarites to have governmental authority in culture. And here we are as parents deluding that. And I think the Lord is really saying to us, we need to wake up. On one hand, we keep saying, we're believing for a revival amongst the youth and the young people and all of that. And then God begins to do this, and we, as the established generation, oftentimes don't make the shift to model for the deliverance generation that's emerging. You know, there's a Moses generation, there's a Joshua generation. Joshua, the distinguishing mark of Joshua, is that when Moses would leave the presence of the Lord at the tent of meeting... There was a young man who would stay and linger. He hungered and lived in the presence of the Lord even more so than Moses. And who was God's choice to give governmental, military, spiritual authority to to lead the people in the conquest of the promised land? It was that young man who lingered in the presence of God. So how many times, I grew up in a time where it was the phrase of the older generation uh, when this charismatic Jesus people movement is exploding, their favorite phrase was, brother, take it easy, still water runs deep. It's like all the zeal, all the, all the, external joy and jumping and raising your hands. Uh, eventually, you're going to settle down and become dead just like me. That's what that generation was always saying to us. And out of that generation emerged some of us sitting here today. And the reason that we're still sitting here today is because the coals of those fires still exist in our hearts. And what the Spirit of God wants to do is when he raises up now a fresh generation and pours out his Spirit on them, that they might prophesy, that they might wield influence and authority in the earth, that their generation may shift culture. We need to get on board with that. We need to link arms with that. We don't just need to cheer them on. We need to link arms with them. And that prophetic encouragement came forth yesterday. 
some of that uh, during our time of prayer. We got a hold of the heart of God and God began to instruct us and I want to make sure that we all got the benefit of that. But what came to my mind is this Amos thing where God did not hang the responsibility on the generation that was emerging that needed to be submitted to authority, connected with leaders. He spoke to those who were already established as that parental generation and says, you guys need to get with the program. And oftentimes it's easy for us to see God moving among the youth and we want to preach to the youth. But just as much as preaching to the youth, we need to encourage and admonish our own generation to get with the program. Because God's plan is not to gather all the young people together in this environment that's all full of zeal and then choosing the most immature adult and put them in charge of all these kids. What God wants to do is he wants to take all of us as mothers and fathers and, as, and grandparents and connect us heart to heart, linking our arms, arms to arm, and that there would be one generation of faith that is walking together. That that generational gap is healed. And the emerging generation does not have the authority to heal that generation gap. Because they don't have authority over you and me. But we have authority over them. And it's up to us to say, no, we're linking arms. Well, you know, you're not that cool. Exactly right. Cool is not a kingdom value, though. Power is a kingdom value. Unity is a kingdom value. Love is a kingdom value. And we love you enough to not leave you unconnected. We're connected with you whether you like it or not. And so whatever it is, we're going we're gonna to take the hits up front, and we're going to be a blessing to this emerging generation. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, let's all stand. On that note, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. So how was that for a tithes and offerings message? <laughs> uh, oftentimes we look around at the adults next to us and we think, we're in this together. And then there's the kids, like they're kind of a parenthetical addition. Amen? But uh, they're not. They are us also. They're us also. Amen? And we want to, I remember when our kids were little, we, we showed them how to give. Uh, sometimes you, you give them money so that they can participate in the giving. Uh, our kids, whenever we would uh, enter into praise and worship, you know, they, they're a kid. They'd probably rather play with a Tonka truck or a Barbie doll. But that's not what we do in worship. You know, it'd be that, you know, hey, you know, this is, this is praise. So we're going to lift our hands and... We're even going to dance. And then as the parent, we don't say, now you get out there and dance. One of the things that blessed me at this last conference is Dan over here right in the middle. All the kids are moving around and praising and flags and all that, and it just became exceedingly dangerous, right? <laughs> A group of children with flags, sharp, pointy objects, you know, with metal or wood points on the end. But old Dan, he didn't just corral them and... It was like he led them. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. Amen? Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that as we give today, Lord, we're giving as a body. That's powerful. Lord, we're supporting the poor out of these offerings. We're taking care of all the stuff of ministry. And Lord, we're also taking care of your ministers. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. This is something that is part of our worship, as well as part of our training our children in righteousness. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus this morning that you would open up opportunities for us to disciple our own children in the ways of the Lord. This is, this is why we are filled with the Spirit. This is what that means, just like Linda was sharing. That we follow up and we disciple, we link, we hook up with these kids that are ours. Some of them are ours by blood and some of them are ours because of proximity of relationship. Father, we thank you.
for this emerging generation. We thank you for the children. We thank you for the teens and the young adults. And Lord, we refuse to encourage them and remain unconnected. Where in their later years they would say, well, you know, I grew up in this kind of a home, but I really never had a connection. That that would not be our testimony. I grew up in a church and they put up with me. They didn't know what to do with me. But Lord, that their testimony would be, I grew up in a family where my mom and dad discipled me. I grew up in a church where I was a favorite son or daughter. And those who were established, they linked arms with me and they encouraged me and they walked with me and they talked with me. We thank you, Lord, that this will be our testimony. And by faith, we embrace it now. We embrace it now. If you just want to put your hand over your heart, if this is speaking to you, just say, Lord, I embrace it now. I embrace grace. Just let, just let grace come. Grace is wonderful. It just, it just, oftentimes as we humble ourselves, sometimes humble ourselves by listening and considering, suddenly a wealth of grace is made available to us. And we just say, Lord, I receive it. I receive grace. I receive grace that this would be, this would be my testimony. That my grandkids don't come over so I can sugar them, up, sugar them up and send them home. But that I'm sharing in the discipleship of these young leaders. Just keep your hand on your hearts. Suddenly a holy moment. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, give us fresh vision for what's going on in our house. These kids are not a bunch of rug rats and curtain climbers. Lord, these are precious disciples that you have entrusted to us. Prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists, world changers, game changers, powerful Nazarites and prophets.